Dr. Juan Carlos Perotti was interviewed at the SVS office in Chicago, Illinois, by Dr. Melina Kibbe as part of the SVS History Project undertaken by the History Project Work Group, chaired by Dr. James Yao. Dr. Perotti was born in 1942 in Argentina, where he grew up and developed an interest in biology, which he followed through medical school, which he completed in Buenos Aires in 1972. Dr. Perotti continued his training in the United States via residency at the University of Illinois Metro 6 program and a vascular fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic where he first developed the idea of the endovascular technique in 1976. Hello, my name is Melina Kibbe. Today I'd like to welcome Dr. Juan Carlos Perotti to the SVS series on interviews with vascular leaders. This interview series is being conducted and supported by the Society of Vascular Surgery and the intent of this interview series is to interview pioneers in vascular surgery to create a historical archive on vascular surgery directly from the viewpoints of these pioneers. So let's start our interview with Dr. Prodi. Dr. Prodi, why don't you start off by telling me where were you born and raised and tell me a little bit about your family, your parents and your siblings. I was born in Buenos Aires. My father was a businessman and my mother was a teacher. My grandparents were Italians from northern Italy, from Parma and Genova. And I had three brothers and they were all mathematicians and I was the only one who liked biology. And uh, then I went to the elementary school and high school in Buenos Aires also. And uh, the elementary school was an English school because I was living in a suburb where the companies, the railroad companies were, and they were all British. So I went to, um, to a school, an English school, and I learned my, initially uh, my, my language. And, uh, and then we went to the high school and then to university. The system is a little different than in America. Um, we have elementary school, high school, and from high school we went to the university. So I had seven years of medical school, and uh, so we don't have college, we, we have just the university. I so see. When you finish the high school, you, you enter the university for seven years. You mentioned that um, many of the, uh, your family members were mathematicians. So why was it that you had an interest in biology and how did you end up pursuing a career in medicine? Was there some influential event or person? In high school I loved biology and I had two professors of anatomy and biology. They were surgeons. One was a French surgeon who was a very elegant person and showing his operations and showing what kind of work he was doing. And uh, I was delighted with that. And uh, so I love biology and I love uh, surgery from the beginning. And uh, I, I, I like mathematics and I, as a matter of fact, I work a lot with geometry, but uh, I like biology better. My three brothers uh, embraced the engineering and I was the only physician in the, in the family. Were there any barriers uh, in Argentina to pursue a career in medicine? Any barriers that you had to overcome? I had my own because I didn't have a good relationship with my father and uh, I left my house when I was 12 and I went to one of my relatives houses and uh, I didn't have money. So I had to work at the same time and I was working as a nurse and paying my medical school. And, uh, and finally, I got along with my father in the last years, but uh, at that time I was supporting myself just by working and studying at the same time. I didn't have money to buy books, so I was renting books. And that was a good effort. Oh, interesting. I did not know that you, were, uh, that you actually worked as a nurse. That gives you a very interesting, I think, view of the other side, too. After you finished medical school, what did you do? I decided to be a surgeon, so I applied for a residency in surgery, and I went to the university uh, program, and uh, I had a good training in general surgery, and I became a chief resident afterwards. And, uh, but I wanted to do vascular surgery, 
because I was helping someone who was doing vascular surgery and I found that uh, very interesting and uh, a good time for a new beginning of a new specialty and to collaborate on the development of the new specialty. Around what year was that that you uh, graduated from your residency? 1971. And then what did you do after your residency? I stayed in the same hospital and, and then I decided to complete my training in America and I came to Chicago to University of Illinois with uh, Lloyd Nihus, who was a great teacher and, and then I moved to Cleveland to do vascular surgery with Edwin Bevan and Al Humphreys in 1976. And so I completed my training and I went back to Argentina. In 1976? Yes. How did your experience at the Cleveland Clinic impact you and your career? Oh, that had a big impact because uh, I was thinking this is probably one of the best places in the world and they were very meticulous and they, was, they were looking for good results. The main thing was to have good results and they were hard workers and very persistent when the problems arose and, uh, and I learned from them a lot. Now let's talk about one of the things that you're uh, obviously most well known for is the endovascular graft. So tell me when did you first conceive of this idea for an endovascular repair of an abdominal aortic aneurysm? That was in 1976. I was doing cases with Al Humphreys and one day we had two consecutive aortic cases, uh, an aortic aneurysms, and I made the observation that the femoral arteries were pretty big and at the same time I was having my training using the Seldinger technique to do selective uh, visceral arteriograms. So I joined the two ideas, big, big arteries and uh, retrograde approach. And I thought perhaps we could compress the graft, use a very fine graft, compress it and mount it over a metal cage and deploy that in a retrograde fashion from the femoral artery. And, uh, and when we reached the neck of the aneurysm, we could open that up and fix it with barbs or with the friction of the metal and, and replace, the, endogra replace the, the open procedure with this endo endolumina treatment. And what was the material that you used for that very first uh, idea that you envisioned for we the stent? We used uh, uh, elastic stainless steel, like a wire. And uh, I couldn't find a Dacron, a thin Dacron graph, so I used nylon, which was uh, obviously uh, had a lower profile. Uh, knowing that nylon was not a good, uh, uh, a good material, but that was the thinner uh, fabric I could get, and I used the nylon. And I was not very successful because the profile was still big and the system was rigid, was rigid. and uh, so I was not successful getting from the femoral artery up. So I went to the, from the iliacs and I was able to place that into the aorta. Uh, it was not perfect because I didn't use an over-the-wire system. I was just pushing. And, uh, but uh, at least I convinced myself that that was feasible, that obviously I needed uh, better technology and to elaborate the, the method further, but uh, at least I thought this is a good, uh, this is a good idea. And furthermore, uh, one of the patients didn't do well and I thought we are too aggressive with these debilitated old patients and we need to come with someone less aggressive. Mm. And at that time I, I wrote a protocol saying that I was foreseeing a day in which a patient was coming, walking into the operating room. We were doing the case percutaneously and uh, we were covering the entry with a band-aid and the patient was leaving the room walking. I wrote that in 1976. <laughs> so it was a big thought for that time, but uh, I was convinced that that was feasible. So let me take you back. When you first conceived the, of the idea, you were at the Cleveland Clinic finishing yeah. your fellowship. 
And so your initial animal studies were in dog, and were those also at Cleveland Clinic? Yeah, it was not a specific uh, experiment. I was using the dogs. I was working with intestinal ischemia. And before sacrificing the dog, I, I was using those dogs because I didn't have permission to have more dogs to use for this project. So I was using the same dog. But that was, I would say, a pilot, pilot treatment or pilot attempt. Did you find, um, I think a lot of people would be interested in finding out how you actually went from the idea to executing it in the actual animal studies because that seems like one of the biggest hurdles is you have the idea but if you don't pursue the idea. Do you have thoughts on that? It took me 14 years, that's a long time, uh, from the idea to do the first clinical case. So initially I was using a self-expandable metal and uh, I didn't have any support from any company, so I was supporting that from my pocket. And uh, when I went back to Buenos Aires, I kept trying and doing be bench testing with that. Uh, and I was more and more convinced that that was feasible. Um, unfortunately, uh, that was very expensive for me, and I was very slow in terms of developing new things. And finally, in 1988, I, I, I met Julio Palmas in Washington, D.C., during a TCT meeting, and he was presenting his stent. And that was ready, and so I approached him, and I told him about my project, and he gave me a couple of stents, and I went back to Argentina, and uh, I produced those stents with the person who was producing missiles. He was selling missiles to... Iraq, and I convinced him, instead of killing people, why don't you help people? <laughs> and he said, I'm going to do both. <laughs> so he continued producing missiles, but he was producing stents for me, and I had to redesign the Palmas tent to reach uh, 34, 35 millimeters. So it was not only a bigger Palmas, but a redesign uh, the stent to, to reach that size for human use. And uh, so that was 12 years after you uh, graduated from your fellowship in Cleveland Clinic, you said 1988. Yeah. So in that time frame from 76 to 88, you must have made other changes uh, of your design. So in addition to going to the Palma stent, what other changes did you make? I had a better metal, so I was producing this self-expandable system. And uh, instead of having uh, two bridges, I had one to make it more flexible and uh, I was using over the wire. So and I couldn't find someone to produce a thinner graph for me. Uh, I was uh, trying to convince Boston Scientific uh, and Intervascular, but I couldn't, I couldn't pay them, so uh, I didn't get it. So uh, I, I was using nylon, um, a very thin nylon uh, fabric, and that worked obviously, and, uh, but with Julio, when, when I met Julio, I thought uh, his stent's already developed. All I have to do is just to suture that to the graft, and that's it, and that was what I did. So that was in 1988. Now tell me, when did you f put the first endograph in a patient? What year, and tell me the scenario surrounding that. So I did 42 uh, animal studies with a with the self, with the balloon expandable. I did much more with the self expandable, but uh, with this balloon expandable, I did 42 experiments following those dogs. <clears throat> and one day I was convinced that uh, I was ready, and uh, I had a phone call from the president of Argentina. Uh, he was my patient. Uh, I did an endotrectomy on him because he was having TIAs. So he told me that he learned that I was working with a system less aggressive for treating aneurysms, and he had a relative with an aneurysm, and he was uh, in bad shape. He had a COPD, and he couldn't have surgery. So he asked me, can you treat my relative? And I told him, you're sure. And so I met the patient, I met the family, and I was showing all the x-rays before and after, and they were very happy. They were telling me, you have a lot of experience. And I told them, hold it, hold it, those are dogs, they're not human beings. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be the first human being. 
And so I decided to do it because the indication was good, the anatomy was good, and I was ready. I had, you know, all my training in experimental work, so I was able to, to do it. And how did that first case go? Beautifully. I did it in less than 30 minutes. And how long did the patient stay in the hospital? The patient, uh, uh, we did the second patient but open. Um, we had dinner and after dinner we went to see our patients. And the patient with the endo treatment was having dinner. And the other patient was still intubated. So I thought to myself, this, this is durable, it's going to make a revolution. Because the patient was ready to go. That's quite a contrast. And actually he stayed for two more days. But the following day, he was walking. And, and this patient survived uh, nine years. And uh, we had to put a second endograft, we did to, a secondary procedure, uh, to fix the distal leak. So we did an yoro uniliac and fem fem. Mm -hmm. But he survived. Uh, he died after having a pancreatic cancer. Now, in your early days, um, those cases went really well. But did you have some really tough cases? Did patients die, or did anything happen that made you question the validity of this approach? True. The initial 22 cases went very well. Um, we were doing yoro-yoric cases, so, so we had patients with proximal distal neck, which is unusual. But uh, finally, we decided to do a bifurcated graft. And the patient was the father of one, one of my partners. The patient had a big aneurysm, it was about nine centimeters, and uh, full of thrombus. So we did a bifurcation, uh, passing a wire from the contralateral side and attaching the wire to the contralateral limb. Uh, it was not easy, but we did it. Uh, we put stents in the proximal end and in both iliacs. We did the final angiogram, everything was perfect. But the patient had a base excess of minus 21. And I started to think something is wrong here. And uh, so when we discovered the lower extremities, they had libido reticularis. Mm. And, uh, and also the patient started to have uh, an ileus. And that patient had massive microembolization from the instrumentation inside the sac. That was the first catastrophe, that was the case number 22, and actually it was the father of one of my friends. And um, the patient passed away in two days, I think. So uh, I decided to stop the project. And uh, I, I felt so bad with this uh, case that uh, for three months uh, I didn't do anything. So how did you get over that? What made you decide to restart the project? At least uh, I thought that I, uh, I learned about the cause of the problem and uh, there was excessive instrumentation. And uh, so after three months we had a, an anatomical favorable case and I restarted. The patient did well, so we were doing the same cases but uh, more carefully thinking about the complication we could have. And actu actually, uh, we did have complications uh, in the initial patients that were coming back, um, some of them with distal type B endoleaks, and we had to fix that with the neuro uniliac system that was uh, simple and we didn't need instrumentation into the sac, it was very simple. And since then we started to do neuro uniliacs in every patient and fem fem bypass, including the contralateral iliac with detachable balloons initially and with cover stents afterwards. And with that, the results were much better in the long term because the initial results with the Oriori was perfect, were perfect, but uh, in the long term, we did have about 60% of distal endoleaks, and we had to fix that with the autoiliac endografts. With the autoiliac endograft, the results were very good, and we still receive CTs from patients we did in Europe with a very long follow-up. The last one I received from Ferrara, Italy, was 17 years, and, uh, and the patient was doing great, and the aneurysm completely disappeared, and the 
the stand was in, in a good position. So uh, with the auto Iliac, we were much happier and safer. We think, we think that was a safer procedure and that the bifurcated endograft, at least at that time. When you were doing those cases, who was making these grafts? Were you actually making all these materials and sterilizing them yourself? I was, uh, I had a, the engineer I told you about producing stents. And I had another uh, person who was producing grafts, Barone. Uh, he has a family company producing grafts and he was producing graft, special grafts for me. I asked him to have a very thin graft with expandable ends. And that was the graft he was producing and uh, I was using. So we had actually one size that fit feed every, everyone because the end was expandable and, uh, and the stent was only one stent. So the only difference is the size of balloons we were using. And were you sewing the graft to the stent right. in the operating room yourself yes. under yes. sterile conditions? Yes. Back in those days when you were doing these cases, did you need to have IRB approval or was this kind of before all of that? How did that work in Argentina? I asked my institution uh, for permission and uh, after a month of analysis, they told me that I was allowed to treat patients that were rejected at least from two places, two well-known institutions, to have an open procedure. And they gave me permission initially for 50 patients. And um, obviously I was showing them all the results. And when we had this uh, big problem, they were also very concerned and I have to ask for another permission to restart. But they, they were very positive uh, because uh, I've shown them the animal studies and the results in the long term, even in the long term, were, were good. Now, at the time that you were doing this, what was your clinical practice like? I was very busy. I was doing a lot of cases. Were you strictly vascular or did you also do general surgery? At that time, I was doing just uh, vascular surgery. But uh, I had a huge practice, and uh, I remember when, when I, I, I did the endotrectomy on the president, uh, I was doing between six or six carotid endotrectomies a day. Oh, you were quite busy. <laughs> and were you doing any endovascular, like angiograms or anything at that time in your practice? I was doing angiograms because I had learned uh, Sandinger technique in Cleveland, and I loved that. Uh, I love to do selective and super selective arteriograms. And, uh, and that was part of the game because knowing that it was easier for me to, to do all the cases I, were do I was doing afterwards. Now tell me about your experience with getting your first case report published. And tell me, did you experience any challenges getting that published? I did the initial five cases that went very well. One of the cases was a dissecting aneurysm, an inferior dissecting aneurysm. The patient was having excruciating pain and an enlarging aneurysm. And even after dropping the pressure, the pain was not tolerable and, and the patient was doing pretty bad. So we did that case. We did another case with uh, spontaneous microembolization. And we put the endograft and we used prostaglandin. That patient did well. We completed five patients. And Frank Riado invited me to a meeting in Miami, the Pan American meeting. And I presented my initial five cases. And uh, John Bergen was in the audience. And uh, he was very excited. When I finished my presentation, he invited me to have dinner. And, uh, and he was asking me about the cases we have done. And uh, he suggested me to present. He, he, he asked me, have you presented this? Uh, and I told him I have, and uh, I presented this for the Journal of Vascular Surgery. I had a friend in Chicago, uh, George Pollitt, uh, who was uh, a vascular surgeon who had training with John Manick, and he presented the paper for me, and, uh, and the paper was rejected from the Journal of Vascular Surgery. And not only rejected, some of the people were very angry. And <laughs> Uh, what kind of comments did you receive when they rejected the paper? How do you dare to challenge the, the best operation we have? 
And uh, I thought to myself, this is going to take time, but I was convinced that it was going to work. So tell me, after you were uh, rejected from JVS, what did you do? John Bergen suggested me uh, to present this to the Annals of Vascular Surgery, which I did, and uh, in a few months uh, this was published with his commentary at the end. And so that would be this publication uh, in uh, the Annals of Vascular Surgery in 1991, and this was entitled Transfemoral Intraluminal Graft Implantation for Abdominal Aortic Aneurysms. After this was published, what happened? What, how was this received by the general vascular community? That article made an explosion because I started to have phone calls, several phone calls a day uh, with invitations. And um, I didn't accept the invitations because I needed to continue to do cases and gain experience because five cases was not enough. But uh, I was going to some few meetings uh, presenting these cases, but uh, my intention was to, to have more experience before presenting this again. Interesting. Now, tell me that um, about another person. I understand that there is a Russian surgeon, Dr. Volodos, who had a publication that actually came out in 1987 about endovascular repair of aneurysms. Tell me about that, and tell me about that surgeon. I heard about him. Um, at that time, I was working with uh, Cordis, with J&J, and Cordis sent someone to, to Ukraine to meet him. And uh, he went to his hospital, and uh, he was not received. And he was waiting for him in the operating room, and he didn't allow anybody to enter the operating room, and he didn't receive anything, anybody. So um, this person in, was in, in Ukraine, and he was asking people in the hospital about this procedure, and they were telling him that he was opening the artery and placing the graft inside and suturing the artery initially. But uh, I'm sure he did some cases. Um, the publications were in journals with no peer review, and uh, I tried to find um, Volodos. I went to Russia, invited, oh. and he was supposed to co-chair one of the meetings with me, and he didn't show up. And um, so I was asking the, the people in the audience, and uh, they were telling me that um, he was not open to discussions, and he was not showing the cases, not showing follow-ups. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, the the guys from Russia they had no experience with endografts, so they were just starting to use endografts. So what he did uh, didn't have a big impact, at least uh, in Russia, um, in terms of developing this new technique. So I, I, I need to find him. I heard that he was invited to the Charing Cross and he didn't go. Um, but uh, I have no questions that there were several people thinking uh, on the same idea, uh, like um, uh, Balko, for instance, in the 80s, uh, Lazarus in the 80s. This is, is common sense. Uh, I don't think it's, it's a great idea. It's just uh, um, was an early idea. Today, everybody is, would be thinking about the same way. But uh, I'm sure Voloros probably did some cases, uh, but the revolution was not started by him. I, I think we started the revolution because we did what we were supposed to do, is to be honest, present all the cases, complications, follow up, and, uh, and opening our doors also for everybody to come into the operating room and, and learn about the procedure. And we were traveling, teaching the procedure also in America and Europe, Asia and Africa. The only thing I would disagree with about what you said is that I think it was a great idea. <laughs> so I disagree with you there. Now, another important question is, you know, as an inventor of technology, 
Did you protect the intellectual property of this idea of yours? Uh, this is a very important topic because in Argentina, if you are a surgeon, you are not supposed to be a businessman related to medicine. So uh, if you are a doctor, you, can have, have a, you cannot have a pharmacy or an industry. So I was not protecting my ideas. Uh, I was supposed to be just a surgeon and my ideas uh, had to be you know, uh, developed by someone else. So um, then when I met Julio Palmas, he suggested me, uh, he said, why don't you protect this idea? And uh, I did it, but uh, I made a big mistake. The attorney was uh, not a good attorney and the protection was very weak. But my intention was not to make money. So you do not hold the patent? Yeah, uh, I do. You do hold the patent on this, yeah. but when you say it's very weak, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? It's weak because it covers just balloon expandable. And uh, wow. in addition, I, I made a big mistake to license this patent to one company, which was Johnson & Johnson that didn't behave in a good way for me. And, uh, and some people ask me why I'm not using a balloon expandable. And the reason is that I transfer my license to J&J and J&J didn't do anything and prevented me to go to other companies. But I think the balloon expandable system is still viable and you can use it. As a matter of fact, we use the Palmas tent when we have endoleaks to seal the, the neck and, um, but the reason is that J&J uh, prevented me to develop this um, and uh, they, they were not fair in me. If you were to do it, given what you just said, if you were to do it all over again, what would you have done differently when it came to the intellectual property and licensing out the uh, technology? You have to find a good company, reliable company, which I didn't. And, uh, there are several good companies like uh, Coop, Medtronic, uh, Gore, um, and that worse than that because when I started uh, with the Johnson & Johnson, I was working with Julio Palmas. I invited him to be part of the, 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 the patent and I invited him to be part of the project. And in a few months, he convinced j, &J to develop his own project which was a modification of mine. So J&J &J, uh, decided to stop my project and, uh, and that was the end of, of the development. Now, obviously, you know, you were able to you put your endovascular device into patients early on. However, were there any individuals who were in strong opposition to your work or any institutional pressures that were really in opposition to what you were trying to do? I was very conservative. I was doing just high-risk patients that were not candidates for surgery. So I was receiving patients from surgeons and I was uh, obviously helping them to solve the problem. That's why I didn't have a big opposition. I did have big opposition from the academic surgeons who were thinking that it was nonsense. And, uh, but I didn't care about that because I was convinced that in the long term I, I would be able to prove that this was feasible. Now, one thing that um, I think we all will acknowledge is that we learn from failure. What do you think that you've learned from this process? And in particular, um, were there any failures that you think you really learned from? Uh, we learned that uh, we needed a smaller profile system, more flexible. And also we learned that the auto-iotic was not good for 70, for 60% of the patients. So we needed to do a bifurcated or a auto uniliac And so lower profile, flexible, and go to the iliacs. They were, they were the lessons we learned initially. Who do you consider your mentors? Oh, I have uh, my teacher in Buenos Aires was uh, Professor Manrique, who had training in this country also, and uh, he was great, and uh, he was my mentor in Buenos Aires. And then I, I would say Ed Bevan 
uh, from the Cleveland Clinic was my mentor in America. What do you think about the future of EVAR? I think the future is here already. Uh, we are doing, uh, we're placing endograft with branches for thoracic abdominals uh, for patients with arch aneurysms. So we are going to cover from the aortic valve to, to the groin. Uh, the big limitation is going to be paraplegia, but we are going to find a way to overcome that problem. So I think the future is almost here and is very promising. What advice do you have for other surgeon inventors right now? I, I could uh, speak two hours, but uh, I cannot do that. So I would say keep your mind open. Uh, don't give anything for granted and uh, ask questions and think big without limits. And uh, what seems to be a fantasy could be a reality in a few years. That's good advice. Um, something you mentioned earlier, uh, casually, you mentioned a couple times that you financed your own research. I mean, so all those early dog studies, you paid for all that on your own? No, yeah, I paid for that. When were you ever able to get your research funded? No. Wow. Actually, when, when I did surgery on the president of Argentina, he offered me money. I told him this is private. Uh, you have to people to help. There are poor people. You need to help. And this is my project. This is my idea. I don't want to risk the money from the government. I want to invest my own money. Or someone else who wants to raise the money be my partner. But I couldn't find any. Very interesting. Now, I also understand that you have an institute in Buenos Aires. Tell me about the institute and what is the institute doing now? The institute was created by people who had training at the Cleveland Clinic and uh, the Mayo Clinic. And um, I gave up my position when I moved to St. Louis and I sold my participation. So is the institute still functioning or no? Uh, it's a smaller one. It's smaller now because many people left. Uh, the, the initial group was a superb group of people. Um, there was. Um, cardiac surgeon from the Mayo Clinic, and uh, there were interventional cardiologists and surgeons from, also from Cleveland Clinic, and we were doing very, very well from the beginning, yes. Wow. Now, uh, bringing us to today, uh, do you still operate? Yes, I do. How active are you? I, I do surgery two days a week. I have my clinic two days a week, and I play golf on Fridays. <laughs> I would imagine that your practice would be very boutique. Are you doing pretty much only uh, EVARs or are you doing I'm more doing than EVARs? carotids uh, and complex aneurysms uh, because I have partners who are taking care of most of the patients. But uh, they call me when they have uh, complex aneurysms or some patient that needs carotid stenting, and I do those. Excellent. Now, I also know that through uh, your career, you have been faculty at about six different major academic institutions. Of those, uh, were there particular roles that you played at some of them that were very important to you that stood out more than others? Yeah, initially, uh, I was a Bowman Gray, uh, Wayne State, at the beginning of all of this, and uh, um, they were not convinced that the endovascular treatment was good. So my participation was very short, a few months. Uh, finally, Greg Sicard invited me to be part of the faculty of, Wayne, of uh, Washington University. He gave me a position of professor of surgery, and I stayed there. I enjoyed that very much, and I think I helped them to develop the endovascular skills. Now, um is there a certain anniversary that's approaching? This year is the 20th anniversary of the first case done in America of an endograft. We did it in November and, uh, 1992 with uh, Frank Beek and Michael Marin. And I think we're going to have a celebration in November, I hope. Wonderful, wonderful. What other inventions have you made? My first invention was not related to medicine. It was related to advertising. 
I was going to medical school using a subway and I was watching the windows, the, the black in the windows, and I thought I have to use the stroboscopic principle and have a movie instead of black. So I designed a system to show a movie using the, the movement of the subway. And uh, I was 19 when I designed that, and it worked. But the problem was that the government didn't want to allow people to be in the tunnels because of security problems. Yeah. So that couldn't work. But now they are using the same principle in, in, the, in, in Japan, in Tokyo. Uh, if you go to Narita, the, uh, the airport, and they have the, the same system. Fascinating. <laughs> and what, uh, what other uh, inventions, medical related? Uh, initially I thought that my best invention was the gastrodiploid coronary bypass I developed also. Uh, knowing that arteries behave better than veins, they, they were using the internal mammary and the radial artery and I thought that the gastrodiploid artery was uh, always good and we did some cases gastrodiploid coronary bypass. That didn't have a big impact. Uh, then I invented the endograft and then the flow reversal system to place carotid stenting without the risk of embolization. Then I have a wire uh, that um, is a very soft wire that becomes a rigid wire without exchanging it. Uh, also I invented the endosutures that Aptus is using now. But talking about business, I would say that I'm not the best for advice in business because uh, two persons went to Buenos Aires to invite me to form a company and so I was part of the company uh, Aptus and they diluted my participation and now that the device is FDA approved my participation is 0 0.00001%. Oh my. So don't ask me for advice in business because I'm not the person to go. <laughs> but after you um, had the experience with the um, endovascular device for aneurysms, when you went on to invent the flow reversal, did you approach that in a different way? Yeah, that was a little different because a friend of mine put the money. I uh, was an angel investor. And that was a better business for me. It was not a great business, was better, but it was better than the other one. And you protected the intellectual property? Yes, we did everything. So you did learn from your earlier experience. A little experience. bit. <laughs> you might be a better businessman than you say. In my next life, because life is too short, they have to live another life to do that. <laughs> so it sounds like you're still inventing. Do you have other ideas that you want to talk about and share with us? Yeah, I, uh, I developed or tried to develop um, an off-the-shelf endograph for branches. And, uh, but unfortunately, the company I was working with didn't develop that. Um, but I'm still trying to do that. Uh, and I'm working also with uh, another ideas in relation to aortic dissections with Dr. Berger in the University of Michigan. Tell us about that. Uh, that's a hypothesis that the dilation of the false lumen is related to pressures. We are trying to prove that. How? We have a model, a mechanical model and a mathematical model. And uh, because uh, Ramon Berger is PhD in, in physics, mm -hmm. so uh, we're going, doing a good combination. Uh, I put my ideas and he develops the mathematical model for that. So if you prove that it's related to pressure, what's your plan? You have to cover the entry side, obviously, mm -hmm. but also perhaps you have to do a big fenestration in this part at the same time. So changing topics a little bit, uh, I just want to know what your thoughts are about the merger that happened many years ago now between the SVS and the AAVS. Do you feel that that had an impact on the involvement of international surgeons? I think initially it had, but uh, uh, we are inviting more and more people from overseas to join the effort of the SVS. 
And I think it doesn't make any sense to have two societies doing the same, the same work. And uh, we need to concentrate our efforts uh, with one society. What is the future of American medicine in your eyes? Uh, let, let me tell you the truth. When I came to America, uh, I was using uh, instruments to make knots to save suture and the nurses were telling me you're in a rich country you don't have to do that <laughs> because I was using one suture for the whole <laughs> for the whole anastomosis and they were telling no no use four or five and if you don't like the graft throw it away and get a new one <laughs> and in Argentina I had to to save because we had restricted budget for that so I think America should think about that. Uh, you were wasting money and uh, you need to start thinking on saving not only in sutures but in everything you do because there is room for, for saving money in America and you should do it and to cover everybody if you can and, uh, but to be more efficient in terms of not spending money in things you, need, you don't need to. What did receiving the SVS Medal of Innovation in Vascular Surgery in 2006 mean to you? That was a great honor for me because I have a lot of respect for the society and being the first recipient of the Medal for Innovation for me was very, very important. How does it feel to know that you are being recognized as a pioneer in vascular surgery and that you're going to be part of history? You know, my intention was not the, that. Uh, my intention is to feel that I've been useful for my patients. And uh, so uh, I don't care a lot about honors. And uh, I care more about what I think of myself. Do you have any hobbies outside of surgery and medicine? Sure, yeah. I, I play golf. And I paint. You paint? Yeah. What do you paint? <laughs> Describe the, what type of art? I like um, the classical art, not the other one. The other, the other day I, I was in a, in a place they were showing all kind of art and uh, there was something that without any sense like the new art and one of the fellows there said I think that that picture is, you have to turn the picture. <laughs> he told that to the painter. And the painter is, no, 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 that's the way. No, 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 that's not the way. So it was so ridiculous, the discussion. I thought to myself, this is not the kind of art I like. It's like abstract art. Abstract art. No. Yeah. So what kind of art do you paint? Uh, I paint people. Um, uh, I, I take a picture and I do a retrat. How do you say that? Uh, Portraits? Portraits. Ah, I think we're going to have to get samples of your artwork. <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to tell all of us that I haven't already asked you? I think I have been very happy in my life. Uh, I work hard, but uh, I owe America. I came to this country and they gave me all the opportunities and uh, they treated me in the same way they were treating their own people and I am very grateful. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to let us interview you and um, to basically get your role in vascular surgery uh, documented in a historical way. And I think this is going to be a very important story for many people to listen to. So yes. thank you very thank you. much. In 2013, just after the installation of Pope Francis, Dr. Parodi discovered the identity of a poor priest he operated on in 1980 who was in severe need of help and may not have survived without Parodi's intervention. An internist friend asked me if I was willing to take care of him free of charge. My answer was yes. I took him to the operating room and I found a gangrenous gallbladder. I performed a cholecystectomy and cleaned the area. The priest started to improve rapidly. He was out of dialysis in two days and was discharged ten days later. Years later in Buenos Aires, I received a call from the internist who called me that night in 1980. Do you remember the poor priest? Do you know who he is? It was the Pope himself, who also was raised in Argentina. 
In 2014, Dr. Parodi and his wife met with Pope Francis, who enthusiastically greeted and thanked him for his commitment to caring for another person without compensation. They met for over 40 minutes, with Dr. Parodi expressing how moved he was by the joy and peace he felt radiating from his former patient, the spiritual leader to so many. For me, it was a unique experience that will accompany me for the rest of my life. His hug when I left was full of appreciation and love. I am sure that he made me a different man. I had met a saint.